It's my pleasure to welcome all of you this evening to a special lecture with a special guest, Brother Abdullah al andalusi coming all the way from, <coughs> from Europe. Inshallah, I'll leave you with Brother Abdul Halim, the president of uh, MSA chapter in Henry Ford College, to introduce, inshallah, the speaker. Assalamu alaikum. Abdullah al andalusi is an intellect intellectual <coughs> activist, revivalist thinker, and international speaker based in the UK. Uh, he has spoken at various lectures. <coughs> Uh, he has spoken in various lectures and TV channels on a variety of topics, including Islamic theology, revi revivalism, political philosophy, and a critique of secularism and liberalism. Abdullah has appeared on TV channels and conducted debates on a variety of topical issues. Uh, he is currently the director of the public debate platform, the Muslim Debate Initiative. I'd like to thank uh, the Franklin Masjid and Islamic School and uh, also the uh, MSA of uh, Henry Ford Community College, Robert the Halim, for um, arranging for me to, to be here today, to be uh, in uh, America, to be uh, coming here to uh, Franklin. Is it here? Just a bit more closer here. All right. And um, being able to uh, meet brothers from and sisters from around the world and see how um, how wonderfully diverse my one billion one point six billion uh, family is. So Alhamdulillah. Um, today's discussion uh, is titled "The Purpose of Life," and in some ways, this is mirrors my conversion to Islam as well, and the thinking process that led me to becoming uh, a Muslim. And I think it's very important uh, discussion, a very key one, that we understand why we are a Muslim and why we've chosen Islam. Because if we understand why we're Muslim, then we can better communicate that to others, why Islam is the truth. Because simply saying that uh, we were born into a Muslim family isn't sufficient to convince other people that Islam is true. And having seen the, the beauty of Islam coming from a, a place where I was not guided and I didn't know what the truth was and I was confused uh, as a non-Muslim, I really appreciated uh, the hidayah, the guidance uh, that was given to me and, and I, I hope and pray that Allah guides and continues to guide all of us. But this discussion will be an intellectual one and I will keep it rational and objective and I'll base it around the things that we can see, <coughs> the things that we can observe in the universe and inshallah come to a conclusion about the truth. And hopefully, you'll be able to, to take non-Muslims on this uh, journey of, of uh, investigation to, to help them uh, realize the truth as well. Humans have the capacity to question meaning, and naturally, the purpose of life. It is a fundamental question upon which all other questions are based. And so, it is the, the most important question of them all uh, to ask. It is very interesting to note that people generally only ask the question, how? How do I get a job? How do I get a better job? How do I get an agreeable partner? How do I spend my Friday night? How do I get people to notice me or, or respect me or spend time with me? It's how, 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 how? But the interesting thing is that no one ever asks, why? So why am I living my life? For what reason am I uh, pursuing all these objectives? Why should I follow uh, what the culture of what society has given me or why should I follow the religion that my parents taught me so no one ever asks the question why but they ask the question how so I think that the the real question that we should ask ourselves and obviously ask uh, the, the non-Muslims to ask themselves as well is what should we be doing most human beings blindly accept the environment and the information they are taught. If we blindly accept the values we are told, 
then how can we ever truly make a choice on uh, what, what is the truth or what uh, we should be following? But more importantly, how can we ever be sure that what we are taught is true? Maybe the truth is something completely different to what we think we know, and maybe not bothering to seek it or discover it will have serious consequences both within our lives and possibly in a future reality we haven't yet experienced. So seeing the seriousness of this question, let us embark upon a rational investigation from what we know and see if a solution to this question is available or not. But before I begin, I must emphasize the importance of sincerity in this investigation. Sincerity is approaching a topic without emotional bias or unsubstantiated assumptions, especially those based upon a pre-existing viewpoint to life which itself is unproven. So now let us investigate the issue of today's lecture both rationally and objectively without assumptions and without being slanted by bias. What is the purpose of life? Well, if I'm going to be true to the promise and not make assumptions, then I think we should start with a, a question that occurs before asking the question, what is the purpose of life? Is there even a purpose to life or existence? Or does everything exist have no meaning and we're all just a result of a big accident? So first I want to ask, what do we mean by purpose? Well, purpose means that, that there's a reason for something to exist. That thing that exists is intended. There's an intention behind it. The reason for something to exist would constitute the higher meaning to its existence. This meaning is the intention behind that existence. Thus, for something to have a purpose, it must um, be intended. Now, if something could create itself, then it could define its own intention. But because the act of creating oneself requires the one to pre-exist to do so, it's rationally absurd. So, what exists around us didn't make itself. So the intention behind one's existence can only come from an external source to the created thing. Therefore, since we did not create ourselves, we must identify the source of our creation and determine if there was an intentionality behind this creation or not. Let's start by what we see in existence that we exist within. So we, we exist within existence. So all, everything around us is the reality that we exist within. So what do we see? So we see objects and forces, rocks, mountains, the sun, the moon, gravity, electromagnetic forces, qu um, quantum particles, and so on and so forth. These objects all have characteristics and limitations that define what they are, how they behave, and to what degree they interact with other things. These things seem mindless and operate within a determined set of laws that came into existence along with their creation. But how do we know they were created? Forget the recent scientific discovery of the Big Bang. Let us use the rational method that has been available since the first human being, to, uh, which is observation and deduction based on what we can observe. These objects and forces that we see operate under laws, and these laws describe the relationship between the attributes of different objects and forces to other objects and forces. For example, the relationship between two objects of mass is gravity, which would attract them together. So that's their relationship between these two objects. And all the objects in the universe, they all forces, have a relationship between themselves. The f this force of gravity is determined by the amount of mass each object has proportional to the distance from uh, th th they are from one another. It seems that all objects with defined attributes cannot choose different attributes for themselves, and they are limited to the forms they come in. The rational question to ask is, what gave these limited forms the uh, attributes they possess? <coughs> Since the very fact that they um, have this limit, a limited form, a particular ability and a particular existence means that they were determined by something. Something measured out these proportions, something determined the mass of, uh, of, of these two objects, of, of uh, like two planets or, or, or suns or gravity or the total amount of matter in the universe. It's not double than what it is, it's not half of what it is, it's a specific amount. So the, same, so the question is, why is it that particular amount and not um, bigger or lesser than that? Something determined its size and its proportion. I've already shown how absurd it is to consider something could create itself. So the only conclusion we can come to is the following rule. Anything that exists which, which is finite and limited was created by some means and by something else. This is the rational law of cause and effect, otherwise known as causality. 
almost every human thought is based upon causality. From detective work, to a sportsman's <coughs> gaming performance, to business income, to scientific experimentation, and making conclusions from the results of experiments. Everything is based on cause and effect. So if I was to test, if I was to, to uh, train, train a, a, my a pet cat, I don't have a pet cat, but if I was to, if I was to train my pet cat and I would train it in a certain way and it, it behaved a certain way, then I offered it, uh, let's say a cookie and it didn't like the cookie, and then I offered it some cat food and it liked the cat food, I can conclude that the change of behavior, the effect was because of the cause, the change in the cause. I offered it cat food, it liked, it ate the cat food. I offered it cookie, it behaved differently. So we can see that there is a cause and effect happening. And it is, a, it is basic human rationality. We use it all the time. So now we know that there must be something else which creates the limited, limited objects and forces we observe. The next rational question to ask is, what is the nature of this something else which created everything we can observe? There can only be two options. Either it is essentially limited and finite as well, like the objects it created, or it is not limited and it is not finite. Let's consider the first option. If what created the limited objects in the universe is also finite and limited as well, then the, this does not answer the question, but merely defers it to the next level up. Because you could say, then what created that then, this other thing, this external thing to the universe, which created the universe, <coughs> and what created that? If it is also limited and it also uh, ha is finite. And if we constantly opted for an option of limited and finite uh, uh, cause and effects going on uh, forever, then the ultimate question would never be answered, and this would mean that nothing would actually come into existence. And I use, a, I use my famous example, which is based like this. If you have a, a domino rally, so one domino placed in front of the other in forming a chain, and if I started off with a, 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 a domino chain that has no beginning, there is no beginning to this domino chain. Would any of the dominoes falling down, there must be a point where it's pushed. There must be a point where a domino is being pushed. But if the chain of dominoes goes on forever, infinitely, there will never be any start point. There will never be any, any place where you could begin pushing the dominoes for them to begin falling down. So you'd never reach any point in that chain because no domino would ever fall down. Likewise, if this universe had an infinite number of universes before it which caused this universe to come to existence for an infinite chain we wouldn't reach this point you'd have to cross infinity to reach this point how can you cross infinity and where is the first starting point won't be there i use another um, example which I, I commonly use imagine i needed uh, one dollar and i did not have any money and i need one dollar to pay for a sandwich i asked a, a colleague of mine do you, you know, to, uh, to give me a dollar. They did not have a dollar. They asked uh, not their friend to give them a dollar. That person also didn't have a dollar. And they asked their friend then to ask uh, for a dollar, and so on. If you asked an infinite number of people who were all poor for a dollar, would I receive a dollar? No. It's, it's just rational sense. It's just co it's, this is common sense. So to say that there's an infinite number of finite, limited things before this universe that brought this universe into existence is absurd uh, and irrational. So an infinite chain of connected things is impossible. This is called the infinite regress fallacy and philosophers, scientists and even atheists have all generally accepted uh, in practice this fallacy if not grudgingly in belief. Thus the only solution to the beginning of causality is something which is not finite and not limited. The uh, starting point, the first cause. And of course in the English language you want, we, only, we have a name for what is something which is not finite and not limited and that is infinite and unlimited. And I'll call this for, the, for, the point, for this point in time just the first cause. So what is this infinite and unlimited thing which started everything in existence? Well that cannot be answered in detail from our point of view since we are limited and finite objects gazing up into a reality that has no limit. So our minds will literally not be able to comprehend limitlessness or infinitude or existence beyond time and change and even form. And this is why in the English language 
the word infinite just means not finite. Infinis from the Latin, not finite. And unlimited just means not limited. That's the only way you can define, by, give a definition of this thing, is by what it's not. And it's, and it's not us. So whatever it is, it's not us, it's not limited, it's not in creation. That's the only uh, fundamental definition you can give it. But now we have reached a very pertinent question. Does this first cause possess intentionality? Because the discussion today is about purpose, and purpose requires intentionality. So does the first cause that caused everything into exist, does it possess intentionality? Since it was uncreated, it would, not, it would possess uh, no intention behind its own existence. So nothing intended it to exist. But the real question is, did it create everything else with an intention, or was it merely a mindless process? Well, let's consider the pos possibility of it being a mindless process. This infinite thing creates mindlessly. If this infinite thing caused creative things uh, to exist without intention, then it would not be the first cause. Why do I say this? Because for it to create something mindlessly would mean that something outside of it was causing it to do so or some internal mechanism inside it was causing it to create universes. If it is something outside it that's causing this first cause to make universes, then it is not the first cause. Whatever's making it make universes, that's the first cause. And, it's, and that would just be the second cause or, or a link in the chain. And that would start another infinite regression problem, because then what caused that, what caused that, what caused that, you, you can't escape it. So then that leaves the only other possibility, which is maybe there's an internal mechanism inside this infinite thing that just makes it create universes. But then this mechanism would be more fundamental than the first cause, and this mechanism itself would then be the first cause. And of course, then the question would be, what, what makes that mechanism want to create universes? And then, that, and again, you won't, you, that won't have any answer. If you keep saying, maybe another mechanism, mechanism, maybe another mechanism, maybe another mechanism, for infinity, another infinite regression problem, another infinite regression fallacy. There has to be a starting point uh, to actually begin the process of, of creating universes. Thus, the only conclusion that you can come to, the only conclusion that makes sense, is that the first cause simply chose to initiate the existence of other things. It simply initiated itself of its own choice, the universe and everything that exists. And it had no motivation making it do it, nor did it do it out of necessity. But rather, it did it as an act of its infinite volition, i.e. out of its will. The process, the presence of volition or choice indicates to us that this first cause has a will. So now we know two things. We know that the first, there is a first cause which is infinite and unlimited, and we know it has a will. And all this is, can be deduced simply from just observing everything that exists around us and trying to eliminate all the impossibilities. As Sherlock Holmes said, once you eliminate all the impossibilities, everything that's left, no, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. So this is uh, the only possibility that could be. Atheist scientists, in their vain, blustering attempts to, to deny intentionality in the infinite, claim that this infinite first cause, which even they have to admit exists, is random, and the reason the limitations of our universe come into, uh, came into being was not choice, but rather due to a number of infinite other possibilities being tried, i.e. an infinite number of universes, universes uh, being created as well. This theory they call, uh, they call, is called the multiverse theory, and there exists no scientific evidence uh, nor mathematical requirement for the multiverse to exist. It's simply the only explanation they can come up with to avoid um, admitting that the, the, the infinite will has a, uh, has a will. But there is a, a, a problem with this concept. If, they, if this multiverse creates, all right, fine, this multiverse uh, or this first cause creates infinite universes, all right, but what's making it create infinite universes? Whether you say infinite universes are created or a few universes are created, they can't escape. The fundamental problem is what's making this first cause do it? And they have no answer. They just um, are hoping that you accept that there's infinite number of universes, and, and so the reason why all the limitations in this universe, the reason why water boils at 100 degrees 
centigrade and freezes at zero degrees centigrade and that the speed of light is a certain constant and that uh, you know gravity is at a certain proportion based on mass and a certain proportionality and E equals mc squared is simply because there are an infinite number of other possibilities which have all been tried and we're just one of every other of all kinds of variety like pretty much going into a, an infinite Walmart where there's infinite variety and you're going to get something which is uh, eventually you're going to find everything everything there and as I said they still can't answer the, the problem that what is create what is making this first cause make all these universes they can't escape from this so in conclusion the form that all the create objects and forces in creation took was chosen this is now uh, established that there is intentionality behind our creation our forms our limits and the natural laws in the universe were intended contemplate that everything around you the laws in the universe the sun the moon the many suns in the many different uh, star systems and the many different galaxies and everything that exists was all intended this intention emanates from an ultimate creator who either through some process he initiated or through a direct creation that we cannot comprehend caused everything to exist according to his intention in summary we know the creator exists because it created existence <coughs> and we know it he has a will or it has a will because it uh, each thing it creates has defined attributes which can only result from a making a choice between infinite possibilities so now this brings us to the actual question uh, of this lecture what is the purpose or intentionality behind creation so we have intellectually established that creation emanate from intentionality since the first cause would not need anything from uh, his creation in terms of sustenance we can discount, discount that as a possibility so we're not here to feed him so that, or it to sustain its existence it doesn't require us to, maintain, uh, us to help it maintain its existence that wouldn't make any sense however what is certain is that our existence is certainly a manifestation of the power of this first cause to create so we are the proof that this first cause has the power to create first the first thing we can conclude about our purpose is the first thing is that we are evidence of the existence of the creating power of the first cause and now I shall call this first cause using the, the, the term the creator since that defines the first relationship between us and this first cause is creation so it, I will call it now the creator now the intention behind our existence might be merely just to exist as a testament to the creator but there are three addition there are additional considerations we need to take into account firstly we exist under laws and relationships these laws and relationships are part and parcel of our intended existence so our purpose would include being participant in the laws of creation so because there are laws of creation which interact with each other and change happens and we live in change and we, we interact with everything then it's intended for us to be part of this interaction we can conclude this just by observation secondly the objects and forces that were created are not static we're not all frozen in time they change we exist in a changing landscape known as time so we deduce that the creator intends something more <coughs> for us than just our mere existence the purpose behind the things it created must involve change from one state to another state thus the purpose of created things must be connected to time as well furthermore our adherence to the laws of creation must be manifested over the time we exist i.e. our relationship with the creator is the adherence to the ordained laws of creation for the duration of our existence but we haven't finished our investigation yet since there is a very special phenomenon we see in the created things in the universe all created objects and forces are different from each other and there must be a significance to the intended creation of these differences there must be a reason why the universe isn't made up of the same substance there are different kinds of substances, different energies, different forces <coughs> maybe on a basic form, a basic level they're all the same substance but certainly on the big on the macro level on the bigger level they all look different they all are diff they are different colors different forces uh, energy matter and all, and all other kinds of forces 
Uh, we see three basic forms in creation, only three. Inanimate matter, the universe, mountains, planets, stars, in inanimate matter, not animate. Life, or we call animate matter, so uh, matter which is self-animating, I suppose. It comes from the Greek word anima, which means spirit, or spirit within, but it's meant to mean a kind of moving matter. Although we know that all matter moves, but it's actually meant to be a kind of a movement from within, so this is where the word anima came from in the Greek. And a more specific kind of life called humans, or mankind. So these are the three types of creation we see. Is there anything else except these three types of creation? Can anyone think of anything else beyond inanimate matter, life, and mankind? Those are all everything that exists. Sure, I don't know how big the universe is, but I know that it's these three kinds. It can only be these three kinds. All these objects and forces operate within an environment, and they change from one state to another the end state of their existence being the intended finality of their existence, i.e., wherever you end up is where you're meant to be. First, the purpose of all things will and must be realized. So if there's an intention behind our existence, then we will achieve this intention because the Creator, which is infinite, has no limitation. So if the Creator wishes something, something for us or an intention for us, we will reach this intention no matter what. Thus, all things created by the intention of the Creator will have their intended purpose achieved either in this observable reality or in another currently unobservable reality. We cannot assume that all we can see is the only thing that, that <coughs> exists. There could be bigger realities than we know about. As individuals, we are regularly discovering newer and bigger realities than we thought possible, and this is borne out in every realm of human-led investigation. These, uh, the, the kids here in the audience, Maybe some of you have only uh, seen America, but I'm sure if you travel around the world, you'll see different realities, you'll learn different cultures, different things. you'll see a bigger reality to what you thought. Maybe as you're studying in this school, you'll, you'll be taught about uh, science, about geology, about the, uh, how the plate tectonics and stars and astronomy, and you'll see a bigger world than you thought or, or originally thought possible when you grew up in your house. So we are always discovering a bigger reality than we imagined possible. It stands to reason that purpose-built creation, because a car possesses all the attributes required for luxury transportation. It is rational to conclude that if there is a connection between one's intended attributes and one's intended purpose. So you, you investigate a car, you see that all the attributes of a car, if you spend enough time investigating, you could conclude that it was for transportation and for carrying, some, uh, they're for carrying some kind of creature inside itself. That's the only thing you conclude from looking at the attributes of that thing. So we should start to, when we to proceed further in this, we should now begin to examine the attributes of the things we see in, in the environment of this in reality, this created reality. And this will yield clues to inform us to recognize what is the correct narrative or purpose behind our existence. And an explanation of the purpose of creation must explain these three things and the relationship between them for it to actually make sense. So what is the intentionality behind the first kind of objects? Inanimate matter or the, the material things in the universe. The universe, as far as we can see, mostly consists of inanimate objects, forces, planets, stars, mountains, suns, nebula, etc. These things uh, exist, undergo change, and are subject to the forces and interactions of other objects. These interactions are governed by the laws of creation, which no object in creation is exempt from. So no object in creation can choose not to follow these laws uh, that part of, of, of its creation. From this we can conclude that the purpose of matter, or the material world, is to exist and to react to the changes which affect them according to the universal laws intended by the Creator and nothing more. However, we should note that without the existence of these inanimate things, we as observers would never be able to reflect <coughs> upon them and come to the conclusion of, of the existence of the Creator. So the creation intrinsically bears witness to the origin that caused it. To have a purpose means that if the creation is perfect, Every created thing will fulfill it in one way or the other. And inanimate objects will fulfill their purpose by their existence and being subject to the laws of creation. Now, what is the intentionality behind life or inanimate matter? 
Each creation possesses different attributes and thus follows different laws. All created things are signs of the Creator. We've established this. And their existence and what happens to them is also intended. But each created thing operates in its own unique way. Living creatures are creatures that behave with organization and intentionality themselves. This intentionality is witnessed by the proactive behaviors they exhibit that aim towards a goal not caused by the immediate circumstance of the object. For example, a rock will not grow by itself. It relies on accidents of its environment to break it down and compress it into bigger chunks of rock like granite or cooling processes which create crystal formations. But the rock itself is a passive thing. If you leave it in a place, it will do nothing. And until you hit it with a hammer or you throw it into a lava stream. However, life is proactive. It seeks useful materials to absorb and grow, like a plant, with complex chemical processes working in an organized manner to support the survival of the whole object. Life exhibits intentionality to achieve the goal of survival and reproduction. There's a rock. It have an intention to, to preserve its existence and to reproduce? No. But animate objects, life, life does this. Life doesn't stay still. It will be proactive, it will initiate a situation to survive and to uh, make copies of itself. And in complex creatures, the motivation manifests itself in the form of emotions, which carries a reward and punishment mechanism which is pain and pleasure, which comes as a consequence of fulfilling their goal. If you don't fulfill your goal or you're frustrated, then you feel pain. And if you achieve your goal, you feel pleasure. This behavior is part of the nature of their existence. And if all existence is intended, then their behavior and these attributes of emotions and pain and pleasure is also intended, since they were created with these attributes in the first place. Whether you believe the process of their creation was evolution or divine intervention, the, res the end result is the same. We live in a universe where conditions exist that life can be supported. And there is a, must be a reason for this. But living creation, or some living creation, possesses something else very special. Consciousness. And consciousness is a different matter. Consciousness gives creatures the ability to actually witness the creation of God or the Creator. I went ahead of myself there, I just called the Creator for the time being, and experience it. They possess a conscious intentionality and they witness their own existences in unfolding before them. And this brings us to, a, I think, a very key question. What is the purpose of consciousness? Consciousness changes this whole discussion because consciousness is not material, nor would we expect its purpose to be identical to objects that do not possess consciousness, like rocks or plants. They don't possess consciousness. So if a creature possesses consciousness, it must have a, a, a slightly more specific purpose or a different purpose, a slightly different purpose than objects that don't possess consciousness because there must be an intended reason why they have consciousness in the first place. Materialists cannot explain the existence of the mind or experiencing or consciousness. They, there's, no, there's no explanation for it. And they, they can't answer why nature, as they call it, saw fit to include consciousness in living things. Because if you're, I mean, a computer does all the processes and calculations it needs to do without consciousness. So why do we, with our uh, biological computers, require consciousness? Something that's seeing ourselves seeing, hearing ourselves hearing. This mic picks up my sound waves that I generate from my mouth, but it doesn't listen to me. It's not hearing me, but you can hear yourself pick up sound waves and you can see yourself seeing light waves which translate into electrical signals. There is something, there's a witness inside you which is seeing these things. What's the point of this witness? What is this witness? And how, and, and how can a matter, basic matter, produce this witness uh, an immaterial witness inside yourself. So what is this witness? Consciousness, then, we can at least agree, allows creatures to witness creation, and, the, and this we can deduce must be because 
their relationship with the creation is to experience the signs of the creator's existence not just be part of the signs but to experience the signs of the creator's existence so this must be the purpose of consciousness it can only be that purpose it makes no sense why it should exist otherwise and conscious beings are not detached witnesses to the world we're not uh, separate from the world just looking at it we are experiencers we are participants we're in the game we're not spectators we experience the intentionality of life directly through emotion as I said pain and pleasure and we're not just witnesses but we are participants we're in the driver's seat so to speak then there must be something greater than merely existing which conscious beings must fulfill and there must be something greater than merely witnessing that conscious beings must fulfill and then I come to the issue of pain and pleasure pain and pleasure is a sign of a higher natural law than that of the rock because rock doesn't experience pain or pleasure yeah plants respond to stimuli but they don't experience pain or pleasure so there must be a purpose a reason for pain and pleasure this is because it is intended that we possess these attributes and these are basic motivational forces inside us that connect us to causality in the universe and move us to secure higher objectives than merely being passive when we fulfill an instinct or emotion, we are rewarded with pleasure. And when we fail to fulfill a desire or to escape a, a, a cause of pain, we feel pain, we feel frustration. There must be a significance to, the, uh, to experiencing these things rather than just mindlessly responding to the stimuli. We are experiencing these things. The creator of the heavens and the earth, the universe, wants us to witness ourselves in, in our pursuit of our own purpose. So we are not just now witnesses to the existence of this creator, we are now witnesses to ourselves inside this universe pursuing the purpose, pursuing the, the natural law of our existence. We witness that the conscious beings are not always able to fulfill their emotional drives. But there must be a reason why they fulfill that they cannot fulfill their emotional drives if their emotional drives are intended to propel them to push them forward to do something and if they don't and if not able to fulfill it then there must exist some kind of balance to this there must be a reason to this some kind of redress for this because we know that the universe cannot be flawed because an infinite being is not limited by uh, imperfection so it can't be flawed so there must exist some place some other reality beyond our reality where we, there is this true fulfillment of our purpose if we are unable to fulfill our drives in this reality there must be some external reality as well that maintains a balance of, uh, of our frustrations uh, or our, uh, our successes the requirement to the perfection of the intention behind our emotions and intention behind our, our consciousness is called I'll, I'll call it justice let's use this word justice but since we see that justice is not always manifest in its observable reality, the creator may have, create, may have created an, an extend extended reality outside our current observation, outside of what we can see, where this intentionality is realized. And, this, um, and some people may call this an afterlife. Although this would only be speculation, because we can't directly detect an afterlife, but it would seem to make sense to answer why we have emotions, but we're not always able to fulfill these emotions if these emotions are intended to exist in ourselves. Now, uh, brings me to the, I think the main question of today, and this will be the final point, and, I, and it, will, it will end on this crux, which is, what is the intentionality or purpose behind human beings, ourselves? Because animate matter that has emotions and experiences emotions would constitute, would constitute the animals, the animal kingdom, so animals, they experience reality, they witness the creation, they, have, they experience pleasure and pain. Some animals die without being fulfilled, other animals die of being fulfilled. So we can deduce that if they were intended to witness their fulfillment or not, and some of them are not fulfilled in their purpose, and some of them are fulfilled in their purpose, there must exist another reality where these animals might go, where there, there'll be a final justice for this. It wouldn't make rational sense. Because why do they have emotions in the first place, which they can't fulfill, and some, some could. 
So, but now I'm going to speak about more specifically humans, because we are now different from animals. Humans as creation possess the same purpose as the rest of creation and conscious beings. We also act as witnesses to, of creation to the existence of, of the creator. But the human being is observably more complex than any other living creature we can observe. The complexity of humans encompasses three things which make us different from animals. Our ability to think, or as scientists call it, meta-thinking, which allows us to examine our own selves, our environment and our context. This allows us a greater appreciation of our existence, emotions and relationships with the external world. Sure, animals can recollect things, they can recognize things, and they can be trained and recognize trained behaviors. But animals can't think abstractly, construct a mental model of the world, make changes to it, uh, derive new solutions to problems outside of just um, you, what you could call trial and error. So er animals do trial and error to, to, to find solutions. But they can't sit back, appreciate a problem, and then come with a new solution spontaneously. It's never been observed in any experimentation. They don't come up with a spontaneous solution. They keep doing something, trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, until something works, and then they'll keep doing. Then they'll, they'll, keep, they'll do what works. Or they'll remember something they did before that works in a similar situation, and they'll do that, and they'll try that solution. But to actually generate a new solution to the problem, they cannot. When two tribes of, of monkeys fight each other, you never see, uh, and one tribe gets beaten, you never see them facing in them in the other monkeys in round two with a, a better strategy or a better tactics or a, a new ambushing tactics or new uh, a, a means of warfare or weapons. You'll never see that. There's no development. There's no improvement unless it was by, um, they discovered it accidentally. So our ability to think makes us very distinct, uh, distinct and we can imagine very complex situations for ourselves. A complex appreciation of emotions. Animals have the same emotions we do, yes. But we have a deeper appreciation of, the, of, of emotions. Instead of having the attachment of love between two animals, we have romance. It's much more complex on appreciation of the, the emotion of love. Because we add a lot of mental layers onto that concept, onto that uh, emotion. And we have a, a more finer appreciation. It's why you, you can see that people go to um, art galleries and if, if you're one of these, I don't know, maybe hillbillies that don't... Uh, but if, uh, if, if you're not highly cultured and you go to art exhibition, you'll be bored. You'll be bored. Like, yeah, I see, yeah, I see pictures on the wall, I see drawings, I see paintings, yeah, so what? Big deal. But if you have a greater intellectual appreciation to high culture, you might go to art gallery and be amazed. It'll be a, a, an emotional roller coaster for you going from picture to picture, seeing masterpiece after masterpiece. And this is because of intellect and the use of your intellect. The second thing that humans have, different to animals, is we have the ability to store recorded conceptual models of the world, otherwise known as knowledge or information. And that's different from recollection. Recollection is having a memory of a bad experience or a good experience or, so, or, or a memory. Animals have memory too. But we have knowledge, conceptual models. So animal might see a chair and just see a shape and see a, and, and see a particular texture. And if it comes another chair that's, that looks the same, and then it, it will treat it the same way. But we have a concept called chair which has a number of legs. So if we see a chair with three legs, we will still recognize it to be a chair. Or if we see a chair that's made out of metal, or made out of wood, or made out of foam, or one of those bean bags, which is a strange kind of chair, but still, it, it's in the general concept, something like you can sit on that, that keeps you up. This is a concept. Animals don't think like, don't have that ability to conceptualize. We do. It's called knowledge or information. And thirdly, and most importantly, we have the capacity at least from what we can perceive, to make choices, to actually choose. We can even reprogram ourselves to behave differently. Sometimes it's difficult, but it is possible. You can certainly, even, even maybe temporarily, you can make yourself do something you wouldn't normally do. So then, the question really is about human beings. What is the purpose behind choice, behind thinking, and behind knowledge? Why did the creator of the heavens and the earth, of the universe, 
intent us to have choice, to have ability to think, or meta-thinking as the scientists call it, and the ability to hold conceptual knowledge. Why do we have these three things? What's the point of them? What's the purpose of these? The capacity to think and store knowledge gives us the ability to acquire and recognize the truth or the correct reality and correct ourselves from bad habits or things which are destructive. The, the existence of choice within ourselves seems to denote that our relationship with reality is one of a test because when you go to an examination, uh, many of you kids will go to examination and if you have multiple choice exams where you're offered different choices, what is, what, is this, what is this situation you're in? It's a test where you now have to make a choice, seeing if you've made the correct choice based on knowledge or information. If you studied, it's, it's, to, it's to show whether you actually know what you're meant to know. And we can choose to acknowledge and submit to our natural law that governs our creation. We can choose to, sub, to, to acknowledge the truth, and we can choose to acknowledge and submit to the natural law behind our creation or not. This is just a factual observation. So now we have a choice to be part of you know, one with the universe, so to speak, or we can choose to be rebellious or rejecting of the truth and be, uh, what, uh, be an uh, aberration of nature. We can choose. And of course, the consequences of, the, of our choice will probably be redressed in a different existence, possibly. I mean, there must be consequence to not fulfilling your purpose. As I said, if, if the living creatures who, don't feel, who are not fulfilled because maybe a sparrow died um, without um, being able to eat because it was denied uh, food by other animals, where, uh, why did God give the sparrow the emotion of uh, hunger and the feeling uh, of being unfulfilled and then it died? What was the purpose behind that? There must be some redress in another existence than for this. So likewise, if we then reject our purpose, Consciously, see the sparrow didn't have had no choice in that particular example to not to die of hunger, but we have a choice to reject our purpose or be unfulf or unfulfill our purpose or not fulfill our purpose. So there must be. It would I would assume there would probably be a consequence to this. There might be a consequence to this. Humans can choose to become as the truth required them to be. This is because what meta thinking can do. It creates a conceptual model that allows you to self reprogram. Thus you can conform to the truth and make the conscious choice to do so. To consciously submit and recognize the infinite, which is the creator, carries with it a consequence which I assume cannot be exhausted, because you can't exhaust infinity. Likewise, for those who choose to reject the infinite, then justice can only be rationally imparted through a perpetual other existence where the redress, the redress of your choices are, are, will be made to you without end. The condition of the consciousness in this other reality could be an afterlife, if you want to call it that. And it would probably be the finality and completion of your justice, of, of the justice to you, the, the, the finality of your purpose. Because as I said, just because we exist briefly in this life or this uh, reality doesn't mean that we won't reappear in another reality. You can't discount that. And it would seem to suggest that, that, that there might be a strong possibility, but we don't know because uh, we, we, we can't observe it ourselves directly but it would seem to make sense. So then, what is the purpose of our lives? What, what conclusions can we be, can we, have we encountered throughout this entire discussion? We can conclude that we exist as a sign of the power and creation of the uh, uh, creating ability of the Creator. So we are a sign of, of the Creator's existence and we are a sign of the Creator's ability to create. We ex uh, the purpose of our lives is to be witnesses to the signs of the Creator's existence and to voluntarily acknowledge the existence of this Creator. Our purpose is to voluntarily, it would seem, submit to the universal laws assigned to our creation and as social creatures, we relate to other human beings presumably by helping them to submit to the laws of, creations of, the, of their creation as well and achieve their purpose and protect those who cannot do it from those preventing them from doing so who have chosen to reject their purpose. The purpose of our life is to undergo changes until we reach our assigned destiny. And the purpose of our life is to exist according to a higher ideal, being proactive in achieving it 
and not passive, only reacting to events when, when they affect us, but to actually initiate. That, that is the difference between the living and the dead. Sounds familiar, that phrase. So then how can we obtain knowledge of the natural law behind our creation? Because this is our purpose. The, 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 the lecture has been answered. The lecture question has been answered. But what is the natural law? How can we obtain knowledge? What is this natural law that we're meant to be following? Because we're very complex creatures. We're not like a stone or a rock where physics is enough to work out what the laws of uh, rocks and matter is. Although even now, physicists haven't, don't know everything and they're, they're still opening up even with new avenues and new horizons of things they didn't know and they, they are ignorant about. But how do we know our natural law? Because we need to know now. We exist now. We need to know or at least have a way to recognize or to find it or to deduce it. There must be some kind of way. Our metathinking ability and capacity to build abstract mental models of this world, known as knowledge, means that our purpose would probably have to be conveyed to us through the medium of a communication. So the creator must have, by some means of knowledge, conveyed this knowledge to us. There must be a means that this knowledge can be conveyed to us, rationally. It has to exist. And due to our characteristic of having choice, which is intended, the creation cannot, the communication cannot be innate. Like it can't be something that is forced inside you t that you must follow because that would deny the choice. Because we have a choice. So the communication should be one that makes us aware of, this, of, the, of the truth and the reality we live in and be authenticated and offer us the choice to accept it or not. That's all we can deduce. Just rationally. I haven't quoted any religious, religious scriptures. I haven't been biased or prejudiced. I've just done rational investigation using the um, akal or the intellect. And what do we expect then, this guidance then, from the Creator? I mean, I don't know the means of it, I mean, I'm not sure how it's going to be conveyed to us, but what do we expect it to be? What kind of form do we expect it to be in? Or, or what would it tell us? Or what is the authentication that we can say, right, we know this comes from the Creator. We need some means of authenticating it. So we should know it should come. Here's, a, here's some criteria I think would make sense. It should come in the form of intelligible knowledge, so it could be understood by us. It must be able to be understood in the form of knowledge. It revealed in a manner which does not coerce people to acknowledge it. So it, it, it can't, it's not a manner that, that forced us to accept it, but rather we have a choice to see to accept it or not. It has to be conveyed to us through some kind of medium or messenger, most likely to be a human, because anything else we probably wouldn't um, recognize and authentically preserved in its transmission to us. And of course, the most optimal method of preservation would, would be writing that we have. It's, uh, and this is why writing was invented, to preserve memory, preserve knowledge. To con the, the message must contain the communication which confirms and agrees with all the signs in the universe and all the phenomena that we have discussed today in this lecture. So what it tells you must agree with everything we can see around us, our innate nature, the nature of the animate matter, the nature of life, it must agree with all this rational observation we've seen. If, if there's any inconsistency, it can't, and it does not, then it does not answer the reality that we exist, we exist in, and it's not real, it's not true. It can't be true. There wouldn't be, a, how would there be a contradiction? Since the purpose of human existence would define every as aspect, facet, and area of our existence, we can expect that the guidance from this Creator to provide a complete and <coughs> comprehensive way of governing all aspects of human life, society, and thought. If we receive a communication that only told us how to pray, but left everything else uh, up to us to, to, uh, to make mistakes and not, and not know how to, how, to, how to live by, then it's incomplete. It can't, that can't be a communication. That can't be our purpose because every part of our life is based around its purpose. So you can't say, well, yes, uh, you were made to have this very detailed and complex existence, but what I really want from you, the Creator would say, is only just your prayer. Everything else I don't really care about. But why did you create it in the first place? Why did you intend it? My life is bigger than, than, than just the, the praying aspect of my life. So it wouldn't make sense if it's only partial. It must be a complete guidance. It's the guidance that it gives must produce contentment 
and agree with human nature and achieve fundamental satisfaction for the human being and human society, otherwise known as peace. It must agree with your nature. So if you receive, this is communication said, all human beings cannot reproduce. You're not allowed to have any engagement with the opposite gender. You should be celibate. That can't be a revelation or a communication uh, uh, from uh, the creator because we were given the attributes of reproduction. So it disagrees with our nature. It can't be, then that would not be from the creator. And lastly, since all human beings share the same purpose, because we are all human, the guidance from the Creator should be universal for all human beings and for all times and places. So I posit and I conclude that out of all the opinions, theories and claimed communications from the Creator that exist in the world today, there exists only one that meets and agrees with all these criteria and stands out from other beliefs, theories and ideas like a lighthouse in the dark of night and that is Islam. Islam, the word deriving from the Arabic root ihtislam which means uh, ihtislam which means submission. Submission to the will, command and natural law of the creator of existence. And every aspect of Islam agrees with all these criteria which we could deduce. And this by far, whether consciously or intuitively, is the biggest reason people convert to Islam from outside, from a Christianity, from atheism, from so on. Because Islam ma ma makes sense, it agrees with all these thinking process we've just we've gone to to reach this point. And I will conclude with a few verses which pretty much sum up the entire my entire uh, lecture. It says in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa says, and we did not create the heaven and the earth and that which is between them without no purpose. That is the assumption of those who disbelieve. So woe to those who disbelieve. Do they seek a religion or way of life, the word deen, other than the way of life or, 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 or deen of God, while well, whatever is in the heaven and the earth submits to him willingly and will return to him. Everything in the heaven and the earth submits to him. So why are we now wanting to be different from everything in the heavens and the earth? People say that man, <coughs> human beings make religion based around human beings. So we think the whole world revolves around us, the whole universe revolves around us. And in some cases, in some cults, that the, our, the gods we make look like us, which is true for some of these pagan cults. But what does the Quran say? The creation of the heavens and the earth is indeed greater than the creation of mankind, yet most of mankind know not. So we are a small speck in the, in the universe. We're not, the whole universe doesn't revolve around us. We know this after the scientists have looked and investigated, but the Quran has been saying this from the beginning. Of course. And again, there is no creature on or within the earth or bird that flies with its wings except that they are communities like you. We have not neglected in the register a thing. Then unto the Lord they will be gathered. So now animals, as animals, animate matter, conscious matter has a purpose and they will, be, they will have that final fulfillment of their purpose. Again, another ayat, we sent our messengers with clear signs and sent down with them the book and the balance so that men may conduct themselves with justice so that our complex existence of humanity which our emotions and our uh, complexities and the complex situations our minds can create and imagine and invent we receive a communication that gives us a balance <clears throat> a way that we can manage all this complexity and do justice to the fulfilling of our purpose and each other's purpose we can coexist and, and help each other to actually reach our, our intended purpose and of course, they, then do they not reflect upon the Qur'an? If it had been from any other than Allah, they would have found within it many contradictions. Contradiction between itself and contradiction between the Qur'an and the universe and everything that we can, we can see. And there is no contradiction between the rational investigation, which I've which I, I, I deduced purely from observation, and the message <coughs> of the Qur'an. And of course, 
He who created death and life to test you as to which of you is best indeed, and he is exalted in might and forgiving. Change. You exist, you change, and then you come out of ex you, you reach your destiny, and then you come out of existence. Life and death. And between that, it's change. And, and between uh, that, for us, it is a test because of our choice, and because we experience change, and we make choices within this, this environment of change. And of course, the ultimate one which explains mankind's existence the Quran says, I did not create the jinn and mankind except to worship me, except to submit to him, except to acknowledge him, and except to believe in him. And I posit that there is no other belief system, theory, or idea, and please <coughs> bring this up in the question answers, the Q&A, there is no other idea that fulfills all this criteria of what we can expect from a revelation to believe in except Islam. And therefore Islam is the only answer and, solu and solution to the big question what is the purpose in life? It is the acknowledgement that there is one God, that He exists, He created everything, and we must submit to Him and be fulfilled by doing so. Jazakallah khairan, Brother Abdullah, for this deep and great lecture. And alhamdulillah, we didn't have a test after this lecture. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Inshallah, we'll open the door now for questions, if there is any question. From a logical point of view, how would you explain that the Creator created a month? Please. From, from a logical point of view, how would you explain that the Creator created minds that assimilate the knowledge, but not necessarily get always to the right answer? It's like the same way of designing a computer that if you use the, uh, the ayah, وَمَا أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ وَلَوْ حَرَصْتَ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ It's designing a computer system that is get to the true answer 10 to 20 percent of the time. Okay, so how do we explain that, um, looking at uh, sort of problem solving using our minds, that we don't always come with the right answer? Well, that's the thing. If we always came with the right answer, then where would be the effort and striving? Where would be the, the, the change, the motivation to change? Life exists within strife. And, and, and as the Quran says, uh, Allah Subhanahu says that I've, I've made mankind in strife, or in hardship, or in or in, uh, need to, uh, we need to work. So it is part of our intended nature that we must work and that in every aspect of either physical work and mental work. And if you make a mistake, what does that mean? It means you must prepare yourself to excel further, to keep going and to improve and to change. Because without, um, it is imperfection that brings change. If something is perfect, it doesn't change. So we exist in change that means there must be imperfection to our existence so that we can get from A to B in our change, in our, to reach our destiny, to reach our, to change, to become, to develop. And that's part and parcel of the, the intended natural law for our existence. So that's why we don't always get it right. But according to the, the framework of Islam, getting it right is not the, the thing that you will be judged upon, upon because that's outside, outside your control, like that sparrow example where the sparrow will die not getting the food because other animals prevent it from getting that food. It's not the it's not the reason that it couldn't fulfill its its purpose to survive and exist. So it would not be accountable. So we're not accountable for getting it wrong. We are accountable for knowing what the truth is, and when it's our time, our duty now to accept it, knowledge it, we don't accept it, knowledge it, for other reasons. For aberrant reasons for error, for erroneous reasons that we've chosen to, to follow in derogation of the truth. So that would be the answer. I, I, I wanted truly to thank you, not in the generic casual meaning of thank you for bringing this uh, <clears throat> intellect and reasoning and philosophy to the concept of creation. It is just incredible. Um, but I have a comment and then a question. Um, sure. Many philosophers and, and religious authorities, not necessarily Islamic, non-Islamic as well, have dove into the, the, this philosophy of creation. 
and the, the concept of what comes first. The, the, was the creation of the laws of the universe first, and then the objects or the, or the objects first. In other words, did God first or the creator first created the, existence the, the law, question. the time, there is before and after, distance, there is here and there, there is the interdependency between objects. None can live interdependently. You, you need, the, there's interdependent, the, the, the interdependency. The state, steady state of, of balance, these are the laws, and then after the laws were created, then we're gonna go and create the, the, the object. So I just wanna hear your comment on that sequence of pr process. Now that's, but, and then my other question is, you, in, in order for you to answer the question, what is the pur purpose of a human uh, being? You, you, you went through a sequence of, of, uh, of conclusions. Your very, very initial conclusions that you concluded that, well, the purpose of our attribute of having conscious is actually to witness the creation. That, and, and you made a conclusion this is the only way or the only possibility for the purpose of having conscious. Yes. However, it, it is possible, and that's only for the sake of discussion, that actually the purpose of this attribute could be another law of the universe, which is to regulate relations and interdependency between living matters or human beings, rather really than to witness the, 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 the uh, 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 creation of the creator. Sure. Okay, I'll answer your questions in reverse order. If uh, th there are many uh, types of life which can process solutions to problems, um, and like, like, com like biological computers, without need of consciousness, like many plants and things like that, and bacteria and, and so on. So, why is consciousness, which is basically, um, uh, as scientists are saying, is extraneous, it's, it's, in a, it's additional to the brain. Consciousness is an addition, the mind, where they, the mind, they believe it's a it's it's a it's a byproduct of the brain, but the brain doesn't require it, right? Because the brain is a computer. They say it's a, it's a mechanic mechanistic computer. Now they haven't been able to, um, to to answer the question of free will. That's a different discussion. But rather, consciousness has no other function. It can't. There's nothing special it does other than just to witness. That's all it does. The the, the it, it is feasible that there can exist brains or, or, or types of biological computers, and there really does, that don't require consciousness to solve problems and to regulate the natural laws in the universe and so on and so forth, whatever, whatever it is. But then again, the natural laws in the universe are very big, very big things. We are, we're, we're like a, almost, uh, as some atheists would put it, a chemical scum uh, or on, a, on a dirty piece of rock. <laughs> yeah, that's, so we're infecting a piece of rock, i.e. the planet Earth. So uh, consciousness doesn't, do any, doesn't add anything special. To, uh, uh, to animate matter, to life, other than just a witness. And we only know it exists because we, we can see ourselves seeing and hear ourselves hearing, but if I was to dissect human brain or uh, use electromagnetic uh, resonance and, uh, imaging and so on and so forth, I couldn't find consciousness, I can't find it. I can't find it in the brain, I can't find it. Scientists can't find it. They don't know how it's formed. They have theories, they don't know, there's no experimental ev evidence they can produce to, to find it. So. Some scientists believe it's not even needed, and it's not required, and if you think about it, it's not really required, unless it's required to witness, and that's the only explanation. As for uh, what came first, chicken or the egg, the laws, laws are, or objects, um, I suppose this, this mirrors uh, some early Muslim philosophical debates on does essence precede existence or existence precede essence. What I will say is, in, in my opinion, the, it's, A, it's irrelevant to this discussion because whether laws came first or the objects came first, they both exist and they both were created and they both exist together. But in my personal opinion is I think they were created simultaneously because as, as soon as they, they would both come to existence, uh, they, you can't have one without the other. Basically, that, that would be my personal opinion, but it's irrelevant to the, to the question because uh, it, we don't need to know necessarily the, the full mechanisms of how God created the universe, but we know that there was a creator who created the universe and everything that exists is the result of his, his creation. But of course, we should explore how the mechanism behind the creation of the universe, because the more we explore, the better we understand our the creator. And this is what the Quran commands us to do, to observe, to think, to reflect, and look at the ayat of Allah. And as I, I like to say, that as Muslims we have uh, two holy books. The ayat, ayat of, Allah, of, of Allah in the Quran and the ayat of Allah in the universe. So this is uh, my answer. I hope that's a... Uh
That's your point. Uh, so any question from the back? This is, this is de deathly silence at the back. <laughs> any question? Yeah. Sister at the back? Um, you said that the first cause, there are two traits that the first cause is infinite, and what was the other one? Uh, unlimited. And unlimited. So we know that there is no creator to the creator because, it, because of what does not exist. Basically, that you can't have something that creates something else because it's just going to be an infinite chain. So then yes. we know that Allah is infinite because it cannot be anything other than God. Yes. Um, I suppose that a more fundamental question is, why does something need to be caused? Is the question. Why does something need to be caused? You need to have a start point or I mean, as I said, take any object. I mean, I, I, I'll try to find a, a non-man-made object because atheists always accuse me of, be, of using the watchmaker argument, as they like to call it. So I, I use a rock as if I could find one, but I never seem to have one. I would bring it on the airport, but I suppose the customer would ask me why I'm bringing a rock <laughs> into the country. <laughs> so, all right, here we go. The, Catch. If you, just, if you pass it here. If I, all right. It's a, okay, it's a man-made brick, but <laughs> all right, it will do for now. All right, okay, so imagine this was a naturally occurring rock that happened to be uh, re rectangular in shape. Um, the question is, why does this have a certain size, shape, form, mass, color, volume? Why is it not twice as big as it is, or half as big as it is, or a different color? It's not completely orange. Why is it a kind of grayish color with uh, various other uh, uh, pieces inside it? Why is it not one whole? Why is it, why is it a composite of... Uh, of you know, larger chunks. Why is it the way it is? I, what you're really asking is, what defined the limits it has? What gave, uh, determined, or measured out those limits, those parameters of its existence? When you are, if you are a computer programmer, I think some people might here are, I think that probably might be a computer programmer. Um, what do you do when you create a virtual object in, uh, in, in, in the 3D rendering? You define its parameters. It says you cause, you, you cause the object to come into existence, so to speak, in the computer program. So, when the atheist says, oh, well, you say everything should, should be, needs to be created, but what about God? Doesn't God need to be created? This is their counter-argument, they and they're, they're very smug about it as well. Ha-ha, I've got you now. But the response is, okay, show me which limit of God requires to be determined by something else. Or which lim what limit does God possess in his nature? that was determined. Because we say it's unlimited. Unlimited and infinite actually mean the same thing, unlimited and infinite, you can, they're interchangeable. But no limit, and there's no, uh, there's, there's no finite aspect of it. So where is, the, where is the requirement for anything to be determined or measured out or created in, in God? Nothing. And that's why we say that he's not finite, he's, he's not created uh, because he's not limited. And the only definition of the term uh, of, of, for infinite and unlimited is obviously in English not limited and not finite because we don't have any other, as limited creatures, we don't have any other definition to define this, uh, this, uh, this entity. Of course, now I'm going to bring in the Islamic aspect and this requires revelation uh, to, to answer because there are things you can't deduce. Your, your, men, your, your mind can only take you so far and then you require revelation. So. This God being merciful, for example. Merciful, yeah, this is an attribute of God, yes. But unlike the uh, defin a definition for God being un uh, unlimited and uh, infinite, the attribute defines his relationship with us, his chosen relationship with us. So he chooses to be merciful to us. And if, a, if something is merciful, you say, if something does, it shows mercy in a relationship with other people or other things, you call it merciful. Right? That's it. Okay, it's the English language, of course, we're, we're discussing. It's obviously in Arabic. Um, different word, Rahman. And of course, if something creates something else, it's defined by that relationship, it's called a creator. So these are attributes which this thing has chosen to have for itself, i.e. by its relationship with us. But its intrinsic definition, the definition of, of this creator, infinite and unlimited, is outside our ability to comprehend. And so, uh, this is our answer to the, to the atheist is that in the aspects of what it is we can't define it and because it's, it, because it's not limited and, and nothing defined it it, it, it it didn't require to be caused in the first place but everything else which defined requires to be caused to answer your question Another question? Another question?
Uh, the question is this. You mentioned that we are just nothing more than a speck in this whole universe. So planet Earth compared to the whole universe is a small speck. What's the purpose of the remainder of the universe? If, we're, if God only created Earth so we can live on it, did God subhanahu wa ta'ala created the whole universe to support life on Earth so we can, so he can, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can test us? Or these other planets and other galaxies, they have any creatures on them, just like there's an Earth? Okay. It's an interesting question. Um, that's mostly a scientific question because we have, we have to now determine, investigate um, the universe. But our answer is, and I, and I made it very clear, um, when I talked about the purpose of inanimate objects in my lecture, I said that their purpose is to exist and their, their very existence is a testimony of God's, um, uh, of the Creator's power and, and, his, and his ability to create. And that's it. That's all. To imagine they were created for us is an assumption because we're very human centric, right? But the Quran says that the creation of the heavens and the earth are greater, much greater than the, than the creation of mankind. So we think that the entire universe revolves around us. The Quran doesn't say that. It doesn't say the universe revolves around us. Yeah, sure, Allah SWT granted us the ability to subject the, the universe, what we can in our power, to, our, to serve our purposes. That's, that's, that's fine. But we can't, uh, we can't penetrate the, the deepest heavens, the deepest space. And as the Quran says, you know, if you are able to... <coughs> If you are able to penetrate the, the, the heavens, then penetrate them. But you would only penetrate them with others' authority or permission. Right? And it was actually referred to man and jinn, if you can penetrate the deepest heavens. So, we, it, it, it comes from an assumption, maybe a medieval assumption, uh, possibly, um, we, it was quite popular in medieval Christianity, to believe the entire universe revolves around us. And at that time, when all you could see was the night sky, you didn't know how big the universe was, so many uh, people imagined or assumed that the universe revolves around mankind. But the, 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 whether the Bible says that or not, I'm not sure, maybe it does, but the Quran doesn't say that at all. So it's an assumption. Everything that exists is as a result of God's will for, the, for as he sees fit. And the, the, the existence of, of inanimate matter is in itself a worship of God, a testimony to God's power and ability. But we are one of many creations in this universe and we have a, and, and each creation has its own law system, and own special kind of law, whether it's physics or, or, a, great, or a, a law of the jungle or a human law, as you say, a law for human beings. And our purpose is unique and specific to us. <clears throat> Everything else will fulfill its purpose in its own way and for its own, for its own objective. And that's between it and God, not us necessarily. But we, we, yes, we have a relationship with with animals, with relationship with the mountains and the and the and the, the lands and the farms and the things, and our relationship is governed by God's permission to use this. So we have permission from God to use other things that have their own purpose between them and God to, for our purposes as well. But let's not make the assumption that everything exists for our per benefit only. This is uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, us being human centric. On the day of judgment, everything is going to cease, or it is just alive on earth. What, all the, is there life on all these galaxies? Is there anything happening? In, ter in terms of other creatures, all I know, and, I, and it's I mean, only based does on... It makes sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created all these planets and galaxies, there's something on them, or there's life just like here. Well, not necessarily. I mean, uh, what lives on Jupiter? You know, what lives on uh, on, on Venus? I mean, I suppose they they, don't, they sent probes there. They haven't seen anything. And Jupiter is just a big gas ball, just full of gas. It's not it's not solid. So, um, as I said, things exist, and they exist um, for you know for, uh, between its relation between it and its own and its creator. We shouldn't now think that they exist for us. You see, that's 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 an, that's an assumption. But we exist within this, within this big reality, and we have, uh, because we have extra attributes, we have uh, extra special purposes within this uni universe, and that is to witness, because we can have, we are conscious, animals also witness, and, and maybe there are other animals on other planets possibly as well, which are not thinking creatures. I'll, you know, God knows best, I don't know. Maybe we'll, we'll, if we send a probe to other, other planets we can find or not, we'll, we'll see, but all I know, 
is that there only exists jinn as well as human beings, and I rely only I rely on revelation from this, not on uh, science, because th- we haven't been able to prove jinn existence or not, or whether there's um, what's it, those uh, what's it tells the unex- unex- unexplained uh, kind of things, whether you have uh, ghosts and uh, poltergeists and whatever. Uh, I don't know about these things, but um, I rely on revelation for the issue of jinn. As for any other alien life which is like us, um, I I have no idea, and God hasn't seen fit to tell us of that, so I don't know. Uh, just comment. Uh, logic requires the existence of Allah or somebody who started started things. Like if this rock existed here, somebody must have brought it in here. That's how the universe works. <coughs> now, when it so the logic requires that there is a start of somebody who started everything. Now, if logic cannot explain how the start of work because it is beyond our beyond this world. But as far as the universe. And the existence of logic, the, exist- the logic would not exist without a starter. So if we don't have a starter, then even the laws of logic will break down and we cannot really proceed. So. Okay. It's, um, it reminded me of the first person uh, within uh, the Muslim uh, civilization that used this argument, which was the Rasulullah, when he encountered Bedouin. A Sahaba, one companion of his, was debating this Bedouin. Hours and hours and hours. Bedouin was not having it. Bedouin had no reason to believe that God existed or there was any higher power. So the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, encountered this Bedouin, saw these people arguing, and sp- spoke to the Bedouin and used a reality that Bedouin would understand. And he said, if you saw on a desert prints, prints on the ground, what would you conclude from this? And he would say it was probably a, hu- well, a camel had, had, had passed by, or hoof prints probably. And then obviously we know they said, well, look at the, the stars. These are the, uh, the footprints, so, so to speak, of, of God, i.e. the evidence of, 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 uh, of God didn't come by itself, like these, those, those prints uh, in, the, in the sand. But there's something very interesting, though. Though you could conclude that maybe uh, if you saw hoof prints, that it was a camel that was walking across the desert, or, or you can't conclude what color that camel is. You can't conclude that. You can't conclude uh, if it, you know, uh, possibly if the camel was carrying any luggage or anything like that. You wouldn't, you couldn't be able to conclude it, as long as it wasn't too heavy. Then it would be a deep hoof print. I know what, what someone might say now, uh, but uh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know, you wouldn't be able to know this if the camel was covered, was was wearing a, a particular kind of clothing that camels can wear, the Arabs can, you know, uh, saddle, for example. You wouldn't be able to conclude this. All you could conclude is the camel was came because you can't, you didn't, you weren't able to observe the nature of the camel. You only observed that it was a camel. Or it was always, even if it was an indistinct hoof, a print, it could have been anything. It could have been a human, an elephant, or whatever. So, we can only conclude that there exists an infinite unlimited thing. But what does infinite unlimited, what is this thing, it, what, like, what does it look like, if that even has any meaning to say what, what science can look like? But what is it, or what? How can we describe it further? I can't. I have, I, we, there is, we're, it, we're unable to describe any further than that. Because we are limited, we're finite. We are unable. And that's all we can say is not finite, not limited, not us, not the universe. That's the only thing we can say about it. And so you can, we conclude that it exists as to its specific nature. Like, is it merciful? Does it, does it show mercy? Uh, does it show kindness? Does it show generosity? I don't know. We rely on revelation. Although you could say that seeing the, 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 a lot of the signs in the, in the universe why like human beings live and they, are, they have sustenance, that there is a, there is a generosity there. You, maybe you could have this conclusion. But will there be a mercy on, in the next life or in another life for, from this creature, from this, uh, whatever this thing is being, sorry, will this being show us uh, mercy or not, or we don't know exactly what it will do with us. Uh, uh, you know, so this relies on revelation. So there, there's a limit to the human mind, and there's a human, limit to logic, and there's a limit to rational investigation. And all, all I'm proposing in this discussion is how far we can go, what we can conclude, and then come up with a criteria that can help us recognize when we see the truth and 
reject when we see the falsehood or reject if a false idea is, is, is get or taught to us. That's all we can conclude. I have my last, the last question, actually. Sure. I know the subject was really behind your Islam. Uh, can you just you know tell us exactly how that happened and uh, tell us the story? <laughs> Devil the hour. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll be very brief, um, as brief as I can. Um, okay, I was I, I went to a Christian school. My family was um, one parent was Christian, Catholic. Other parent was secular, and I basically, for all intents and purposes, was a Christian. I went to uh, when school went to mass. Uh, where they, they give you the, the bread and the wine and all that, all that thing, uh, the communion. And for all intents and purposes, I thought this was, this, was the, this was the truth, the reality. And then when I encountered um, the, the other religions or other concepts that there are in our read a book on religious education and there were different kinds of truth, different other, other explanations to the universe and to why we exist and our purpose, I said to myself, well, how do I know that Christianity is correct? And... There is no, the other beliefs are not correct because is it just geography or an accident of my birth which made me Christian? Maybe if I was born in Arabia, I'd be Muslim. If I was born in India, I'd be um, Hindu. Uh, I would be Buddhist in or, or in Tibet or wherever. So surely geography or accident can't determine the truth. It doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense, and there can't be many truths to the same question because they they are contradictory. So I decided to leave with Christianity and investigate. But it always made sense to me that, they, that there was a God. And I didn't know about the afterlife after leaving Christianity, but I thought if there's a possibility of hell, I made uh, my own little uh, prayer, my little deal with God. I said, um, if, I'm, if I make it, I'm leaving Christianity, I don't, not, not, don't mean to reject you, I just don't know what the truth is. So don't punish me, please. If you can't tell me the truth, if you show me the truth, I promise, I promise I'll, I'll follow it. And I'll tell the world about it. All right. So please, please, um, you know, show me the truth and don't punish me. All right. Um, and I was, uh, I think, eleven or twelve at the time. And so, uh, and so I started to read, 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 and I read everything you could imagine. Um, America, um, Buddhism, Jainism, Rastafarianism, Mormons, Moonies, Wiccans. Um, various pagan beliefs from various, uh, or polytheist beliefs from various centuries, so Greek mythology, Aztec mythology, and so on and so forth. I read everything you could imagine, black magic, white magic, everything, new age spirituality, everything I could, I could find. And my, my initial theory was that maybe if I piece it all together, I bring all these ideas together, and I found what they all have in common, that would be the truth, or that might be the truth, what they all agree on. But they were saying some wacky things, and th some things didn't make sense, and so I played a, um, a, a process of elimination game. I eliminate the things that didn't make sense that contradict himself, and I start to whittle it away, whittle it away. So I say, all right, Buddhism, purpose in life is to reach enlightenment. Enlightenment means to know your purpose in life. But then I know that I've really re reached my enlightenment, because I know what it is. That would be circular, makes no sense. Besides, karma. So doing good, doing bad, it, it, it will come to you in another life, and, so, and you get reincarnated. Who made that process of reincarnation, who's keeping score, who's got the scorecard on your karma, who's, who's monitoring your system, and who put that system in the first place? Doesn't make any sense. Discounted. Hinduism. Uh, okay, Hinduism is a whole bunch of different beliefs. Uh, they're different, depending on which Hindu you meet, they'll tell you something different. But generally, the idea was that we were all part of God, God split into pieces one day for some unknown reason. Maybe it was molting in their belief. And and then we now have to live in this life of suffering and get back to God through enlightenment and seeking enlightenment. Okay, that, all right then, but let's, let's pause that there. Why are we ignorant of what enlightenment is? Because if God's all-knowing and we're part of God, we'd be all-knowing too. It doesn't make any sense. Why did God suddenly decide to split himself into pieces? That didn't make no sense. How can God change if he exists on an, without time and space? That doesn't make no sense. Discounted. Okay, now we get into the Abrahamic faiths. So we have, uh, let's start with uh, Christian. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to, bit, to, 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 the, to the end. Um, Trinitarian Christianity. Uh, a belief that God became, became finite, so the infinite is finite. Contradictory makes no sense. The incarnation. The Trinity. There are three wills, three different wills. And each will has infinite power. But that's actually three gods. 
Because what is the definition of a god? It's a will with infinite power. So that's three gods. And if there's more than one god, that, which are infinite power, they'd all limit each other out of existence. And they'll be limited and not, not unlimited. And, so, and then why three? Why not four or five or six or ten? Who determined that finite number? See? It doesn't make sense. I've also refuted polytheism accidentally, but okay. <laughs> um, so that's, that's Trinitarian Christianity out the way. Now we're left with Judaism, right? Judaism, okay, monotheism, belief in a universal law behind mankind, that's great, but only for the Jews, and the law doesn't apply to anybody else, uh, but we are all human, so surely it applies to all of us. That doesn't make any sense. That's not what I expected from a revelation. It must be universal. Remember why I said my criteria? It must be universal, applicable to all human beings. So it's close, but no cigar, as they say. So then, now I'm left with Unitarian Christianity, which is an old sect which died out because it was persecuted by the Trinitarians, uh, uh, where they believe in one God, and that Jesus is not God, and they're Christian. That's fine, but the only book they have is the Bible, which has been corrupted by the testimony of the historians, and the Unitarian Christians themselves would admit it's been corrupted because they disagree with some bits they say the Trinitarians wrote into that Bible, and who wrote the Bible in the first place, where's the authentication? of this communication, they don't have it. So the authenticity criteria is not met, discounted. Remember my criteria. So what are we left with? It's the Quran, it's Islam, monotheism, a comprehensive way of life, explains everything in existence, our purpose, life, and inanimate objects matter. Like, like these verses I quoted, I could quote it more, but I, you know, for brevity, I had to quote only, only those verses. And of course, it's been revelated, it's not, not, the Prophet Muhammad wasn't the first prophet to introduce Islam, only the current iteration of Islam, there's been prophets since the first human being, all, all around. In fact, it probably explains why there's a lot of religious similarity in all the, the, the world religions and beliefs, because they originally were corruptions of an original common religion, which was the uh, monotheistic religion. And as, as archaeologists, if an archaeologist was searching for Islam, they wouldn't find it because we don't have a statue to, to dig up out of the ground. So monotheism predates polytheism, not all the way around, as they like to, it's like to suggest. And we know this because the Quraysh were originally, so the, uh, the pagan Arabs were originally monotheists, then they became polytheists. And the, even the ancient Israelites, they, they, they temporarily courted polytheism, and then they were brought back into monotheism again, with all the prophets coming down. We know this from the, from the Torah. So Islam is the only thing that literally makes sense. It explains everything, it explains your life, it explains why we suffer, why we enjoy, why we uh, uh, experience, why we, like, why we change, what we're here to do, why we have dura different durations of life, why, we have, uh, why some people have better intelligence or better wealth or better different disparities amongst human beings is explained, everything is explained. So quite literally, it's not the case that, even if I didn't know the miracle of the Quran from the literary sources, it, it's literary miracle, even if I didn't know that, and I didn't, when I first converted to Islam, I didn't know that. Only when I much came into later, I discovered there's a mu'ajizah, there's a miracle of the Quran in the Quranic language. Even if they didn't know that, the Islam is the only option to choose anyway. It's the, it's the only other possibility. There's no other possibility. There's, no, there's nothing except what the Islamic narrative says. So how could I not accept it when I discovered it? Is that a lot fair? Thank you.